Our scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. It says this. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was the Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Well, we're, we're starting a new message series, as I mentioned earlier, about the power of Thanksgiving. And the idea behind this is that uh, how do we, one, how do we create a lifestyle of gratitude? This is the time of year, obviously, where we begin to think about the idea of Thanksgiving and not just the holiday itself and who's cooking what and who's coming over and when they're coming over and when we're going to do that. But the idea of Thanksgiving, we, I do think that the season does cause us to stop and to reflect in our own lives to be grateful for the things around us. But if you're anything like me, it makes us stop and pause and say, why don't I do this more often? Why don't I feel this way more often? And so we're talking about how can Thanksgiving and gratitude become a lifestyle and we know that gratitude is a lifestyle when it overflows into generosity. True gratitude results in action. That's how we can tell between when we're having a moment of gratitude versus a lifestyle of gratitude. We'll talk more about that over the next coming weeks. But as we approach this season of Thanksgiving, it made me think about all of the ways that we show Thanksgiving to the people around us. And I'll tell you a secret about me, and that secret is this. Um, I write thank you notes. That's not a secret. Um, but I write many thank you notes to people in our congregation, thanking them for their service and things like that. I'm glad. I hope I can't do it. I can't do it enough, but I do it as much as I can. And that's not necessarily the type of thank you note that my secret involves. It's when I receive a personal gift or a physical gift from someone or some, you know, even if it's not a physical gift, you know, we get gifts in, in a variety of senses and ways. Uh, you know, I, I sort of think that for my birthday or Christmas or, you know, can't, like celebration for my kiddo or, or whatever it is, I, I, of course, feel grateful for the blessings that are shared to us. Here's the secret. Sometimes I write thank you notes more out of fear than out of actual gratitude. Does anybody identify with that? Like, I have this picture in my mind that when someone, like, gives us something, the expectation in our culture, obviously, is that we thank them, and there are a variety of ways to do that. But I think when someone gives me a gift, from that moment on, when they know I've received it, they are, like, looking out their front window waiting for my thank you note to arrive from the mail carrier. Like, that's the picture I get in my head. And so I think, well, they, they've done something nice for me, and they're, they're going to notice if I don't thank them. And they're probably waiting for me to thank them. And of course, we don't, we don't, generally, we don't generally do this because we know if, if someone is grateful or not. However, we don't sit there and think, you know, he, you know my, my thank you know better come today. But in my mind, you do, or like, what if, what if that person who gave this to me does think that way? And I don't want them to think that I'm ungrateful. That, I would rather not get a gift at all than for someone to walk away thinking that I would be ungrateful for the love that they've shared with me in that moment. So a lot of times I'm inspired to write, you know, more out of fear that the other person is going to notice and think that I'm a jerk uh, than out of actual gratitude for whatever it is that I have been shared. So I think better write that note, you know, otherwise I'm never going to know unless they don't give us anything next year or, you know, we stop being friends or whatever. Um, but you know what it feels like, whether it's in a thank you note or you are the person who waits for the mail carrier to show up with your thank you note. Regardless, we know what it feels like to receive real, authentic gratitude 
to give real, authentic gratitude. We know what this feels like. Maybe you are a big note writer, whether it's a thank you note or not. I think a lot of gratitude is wrapped up in that method, especially in, in modern times. Maybe, receiving, maybe being on the receiving end of a thoughtful gift is a show of gratitude, is it not? Someone thinks of you and wants to share something with you. That means that they are grateful for who you are in their life. We can get a lot out of that. So we know what it feels like to receive and to give authentic gratitude. And we probably know what it's like to pray witness to inauthentic gratitude as well, don't we? We know what it's like to not receive thanks for something that we have done, for something that we care about, or even for who we are as people. We know what it feels like to not receive that thanks. We can probably assume that the person who we want to receive thanks from is probably grateful, whether they actively, consciously think of it or not. We can know that. But it lacks hard evidence, doesn't it? And that's what me as a thank you note writer wants to portray. I want hard evidence that you know that I appreciate what you've done for me. But if we don't get it at verbally, physically, whatever, there's no hard evidence of someone's gratitude. Because we know as people, regardless of how it's packaged in our culture, we know that real gratitude results in a real response. Real gratitude results in a real response. And I think if anybody knew this, it was Jesus. Imagine the amount of gratitude that was shown to Jesus in his life. All the miracles, all the healings, all the teachings, all the care, all the time spent. He experienced lots of real gratitude. But Jesus also, because of all of this, would have likely experienced a lot of lack of gratitude. A lot of entitlement, maybe, is the right word. In our scripture reading that we, that we just read, we kind of see Jesus experiencing both, don't we? Or from his perspective, Jesus believes that he's experiencing both. It says that Jesus is traveling into Jerusalem, and he passes through Galilee and Samaria, and he finds ten lepers. Now, leprosy in the scripture, we know today leprosy is, is like a specific brand of, of, of skin issues. Now, it's a gen biblically, it's a generic term. Right? There are people who, will, who were sent out into leper colonies for like having acne and scarring and burns and things like that because they obviously medically they didn't understand what was happening. But of course, real true leprosy is very problematic and very contagious. So the only solution was to send people away. And these people being lepers had to identify themselves before even approaching someone else from a distance. And so these 10 lepers are identifying themselves and calling out to Jesus and saying, please have mercy on us, whatever that means. They probably know who Jesus is. This is Luke 17. They probably know who Jesus is. They know the miracles Jesus has accomplished. And they say, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Jesus' response to these 10 men is compassion, and he says, go see the priests and be healed. Jesus says, go talk to your priest. That's how my compassion, my mercy, my pity is going to be shared with you. And the story says that these men did that. They did as Jesus said, and they were healed. Notice it says that they, plural, meaning that not just one of the men would have gone, and so now only one of the men is returning. But they all went to visit the priest and were healed of whatever their problem was, whether it was actually leprosy or something else. These men experience a, a physical, medical change in their life. But as it continues, one of the men came back to Jesus, throwing himself at Jesus' feet and praising God in a loud voice, the scriptures say. And this man, a Samaritan man, who was who to the Jew? More an enemy, at best, to a Jew. And the Samaritan comes back, throws himself at the feet of Jesus, praising God and thanking him for what's happened to him. And so Jesus, upon encountering this man, says, weren't all ten of you cleansed? 
Weren't all 10 of you healed? Where's everyone else? And whether the man responded or not, our scripture doesn't say. But Jesus tells the one man who did come back, he says, rise and go, for your faith has made you well. Now, the story doesn't make clear how much time has passed between when Jesus sent these men away and when they've returned to Jesus. It doesn't say it's all happening sort of in one brief narrative, isn't it? I almost read the story when it says, it says, as they were going, these men were healed. It almost makes it sound like they could have been healed even before getting to the priests, and then they return, one of them returns to Jesus upon realizing that they've been healed. But we don't know how much time has been passing. So we don't know what Jesus was doing or what Jesus was thinking. My thinking is that Jesus is thinking these men have been healed. I've sent them off. I've blessed them just as they've asked. I don't think that the story implies that Jesus is like the person waiting for my thank you note, waiting for these people to come back to thank him for healing them. But upon one of them returning, it does reveal to Jesus, oh yeah, it's great to see you. Um, where's everybody else? Didn't I heal 10 of you? Why are there only one of you? And I, I would dare say, friends, as we, even as we mentioned before, the other nine men who were healed were probably grateful, right? Wouldn't you be? It's fairly simple. They were probably thankful. They had some sort of skin condition, and maybe even perhaps worse than a skin condition, they were outcasts in society. And so now they become healed. Not only are they healed of what could have been a painful condition, but they're socially healed. They can be emotionally healed. They can be spiritually healed in a way that many lepers cannot. So I imagine these other nine men are grateful that all ten men have gratitude for how Jesus has blessed them. Jesus, when the one man returned, doesn't say, how come only one of you is grateful? What does Jesus ask? He says, how come only one of you offered your praise and thanksgiving and gratitude in the right direction? How come only one of you offered your gratitude in the right direction? How come only one of you came to praise God? Is what Jesus asks. See, we know psychologically, emotionally, generic gratitude is good for us. It is healthy. But gratitude is, is a natural emotion, just like anything else. It's a natural response to the reception of blessings or perceived blessings. But who, who are we grateful to and why? If a doctor heals you, you are rightfully thankful for that doctor, for those nurses, for that medical team for being healed. If your friend gives you a gift, you are rightful to be thankful for that friend who has given you a gift. If a parent supports you and loves you and shows you how to love and be loved, be thankful to your parent. For living in a great community, we are grateful to our civic leaders. We're grateful to our neighbors. What about more complex issues? What about the air that we breathe? Do we feel gratitude for that? The food that we eat? The water we drink, the ability to relate and have friendship, the ability to emote, the ability to speak, the ability to communicate. What are we grateful for there? You see, it's because of the grace of God that we have friends and gifts and communities and churches and food and air. It is the creator who has made all of these things possible. We may have to wait, make our way all the way down the line. How, do we how are we thankful for our food? Well, we have to thank our grocer, right? We have to thank our packer and deliverer. We have to thank our farmers. We have to, right? But then all the way back, how do we get to the beginning of that? Something has been created on this earth for that to even begin to be possible. It's because of the grace of God we have anything to be grateful for. 
the priests in this story. If you are the men being healed, are you grateful to your priest? Yeah. The priest was the vessel through which these men had been healed, but ultimately, how are these men healed? What does Jesus say? He says to the man that returns to him, your faith has made you well. It is the grace of God. It is God that has brought healing upon this man and the other nine. Scripture says that every good and perfect gift is, come, is from above, coming down from the Father of light. Everything we could ever have to be grateful for is a gift from God. Those other nine men nine, might not have realized this. That it was Jesus doing the healing despite visiting their priests. And so it was Jesus that deserves all the praise. There was one man out of ten that recognizes that he returns to the presence of Jesus where he belongs. The grateful hearts draw us near to the feet of Jesus. But ultimately, that's what a church is. That's all a church is. A bunch of people who recognize the grace of God, the blessings of God in their life, the blessing of Jesus Christ, and are called to gratitude for what God has given us. And that's not an exclusive club as if we're the only ones that's available to. Friends, in worship, in learning, in serving, in community with one another, we recognize that the gifts that we have are blessings from God, and we return to the feet of Jesus. Like the one Samaritan. We are a community of people who respond generously to the grace given to us by the triune God. We do this in several ways. We just talked about them. I just mentioned them through worship, through service, through learning, through fellowship together. And this is the truth that we can only respond to as generously as we can if individuals live like the Samaritan man, despite what's happening around them. Does our gratitude turn into action? Because it takes, it takes the generosity of God's people for the church to be the church by sharing their time, their gifting, their passions, and their finances. And we're a church family that has done that, to share that same blessing that we have received and turn it around to share it with others. Together, we have served, in one year, we have served over 1,000 meals to our community. This year. We have clothed the cold with almost 200 coats. We have provided school supplies for around 100 Centralia students. We saw over 100 hours of mission in just one afternoon when 50 people engaged in service to the community on serve day. We've worshiped with over 4,000 people in person and even more online in six states and over 12 zip codes. We confirmed seven young people in their faith. We baptized a couple more. We've seen over 1,000 instances of people engaging in learning discipleship through Sunday school, through small groups, through other learning opportunities as well. We had fellowship together in so many different ways through camping outings and celebrating uh, the end of people's ministry with us here at CUMC, with youth gatherings, and so much more. These are just some of the ways that we, as a church, have returned to the feet of Jesus to offer praise and thanksgiving simply in response to what's been given to us. Through all of these things, we, like the Samaritan man, shout the praise of God and lay at the feet of Jesus. And it is through the church that God desires for this glory to be spread. Those that respond to these blessings and gratitude are the church. And just like the cycle of gratitude that looks like what? We become grateful for the blessings we receive. We respond to the gratitude with action. And then we see more of that gratitude return because we see that gratitude being lived out. We become grateful for the gratitude lived out, and we spit out more of it, and it returns in the cycle of gratitude, just like 
that. The church is grateful to be able to be a vessel through which God chooses to bless this community in the world. Every single day, this church, usually, in more than one way or another, is a blessing experienced by the community around us. We hear it all of the time. You hear it even more than I do. I remember um, when I first came here, uh, last, not this past summer 22, but summer of 21, one of the first things I heard from people, they learned that I was coming in, I was going to serve as the Methodist church pastor. Multiple people, third parties, unassociated with our church, say, this church is the most clearly and obviously in the community, loving the community, serving the community. And we're going to continue to do that, but it takes a response and gratitude and action to be able to continue to be that. And so one, one way or another, if you're worshiping with us today, online or in person, or sometime later online, there is something compelling you to do so. Because like I said, that's just what the church is. We worship just in response. We don't worship to curry God's favor. We don't give to curry God's favor. We worship, we serve, we give in response to God's favor already given to us. The Samaritan man did nothing but ask. And he returned after receiving his blessing. Giving back to God in response to all that God has given us is just what we do. And the question is, since God has given us these blessings, how will we respond? Will we we receive our blessing and continue to live out our lives as if we're the other nine men? Or will we daily, hourly, minute by minute, moment by moment, return to the feet of Jesus, shouting loud praise, thanksgiving and gratitude, Not just for what we have, but for who Jesus is. Will we return back to God as much as we possibly can because he is worthy of all of it and more? Because if we do, friends, there is nothing that is going to be able to stop this church from becoming all that God has in store for us. I believe that if we become a community full of people who shower their praise and thanksgiving upon God with every aspect of our lives— it's going to make its way into every aspect of the life of the community, of the people around us, and we're going to see God transform ourselves through that gratitude, which begins with God and ends with God, and transform the world around us as well. May the grace of God make our gratitude grow legs that Jesus might be praised. And, and, if, and if we need to